You're on. Okay, welcome to Free Hands Friday, number 14. We're, uh, I'm David Tipton, and we're here today with uh, Rob Martino. And, uh, hey, guys. So, and we, we also have, uh, well, the, some of the usual gang here. Uh, but why don't we just dig right into it? So, so I thought primarily today we we would be talking about like uh, your your line six the the pod uh, uh, or the line six H five hundred. What is it called? HD five hundred. Yeah, HD. Yeah, uh, which I realize that's exactly what last last week was all about. So, <laughs> so today we will not talk about that at all. Uh, <laughs> Yes, no effects discussion at all this week. Uh, well, there might be slight, <laughs> slight effects discussion, but uh, so so why don't why don't we just start with uh, so how how did you become a stick player, and when and um, my first exposure to the stick was in probably the mid '90s, I would say, and it was like like many other people, um, I was. You know, discovering a lot of different progressive rock, I'd, and King Crimson was one of the bands that um, I discovered when I was in college. Um, and uh, of course, so that was you know, 2011 was was my first exposure to the instrument. And then, as I, I don't, I remember when I first came across a an actual description or an advertisement for the instrument. It might have been in um, Electronic Musician or something like that. I think Stick Enterprises might have been doing ads with them a while ago. And um, and then it was the concept of it that immediately fascinated me because for uh, a majority of my life I've been very interested in music technology, uh, new kinds of um, instrument development, and um, at the time I was sort of a mediocre multi-instrumentalist. Um, you know, I, dab I grew up with formal training in flute, so you know I did, or, you know, concert band and orchestra in college, and, and then when I became really interested in synthesizers in in you know junior high school, um, you know I went through a keyboard phase and then I you know dabbled in guitar and bass, and so when I finally understood what the stick could do, it was like wow, that's that's exactly what I'm looking for. It's like all of these instruments in one. And so, uh, in '95, I ordered a used stick uh, directly from uh, Stick Enterprises. It was a rare uh, Massacre Ebony stick um, from 1976. Um, really uh, neat instrument. Um, whoa, 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 whoa Rob, 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 Rob! I got to stop yeah. you. Did you say ebony? Yes, it was a Massacre Ebony. It's like very dark, dark brown with some light streaks, lighter brown streaks in it. It's a unique kind of. It's not like the jet black ebony that you see, like piano keys or, or some fretboards. Uh, it's a more brownish uh, ebony with some streaks in it of lighter brown. So it's a, it was a really interesting wood. And he only he said he only made he said he made less than ten of those ever. The um, only one I've ever heard of. Grace showed me one when I was out at Stick Enterprises, and it was mm -hmm. an old. I think it was a squared head, and it was one that was the, the, of the same. Yep. Uh, wood that you were mentioning, and she said there's only one or two other ones. Okay. Yeah. yeah that's, uh, okay. I think the serial number was 247 or something like that. Wow. Um, okay. And I still have the wood belt hook because I did replace it with a plastic one, so I I have, still have the the wood ebony belt hook as sort of a keepsake uh, for that instrument. Um, and so when I got the instrument, it was like um, like a lot of people experienced, there was sort of a culture shock there. Um, I was sort of expecting it to be like a guitar and a bass on one neck. And of course, as we all sort of discover, it's it's a very different experience. Um, but I, I stuck with it for a couple of years. I didn't um, really give up any of my other instruments. I uh, you know For a couple of years when I went through free hands, I tried to learn some tunes. And then I was starting to think, well, I was starting to think about alternate tunings like way back then and like maybe... Uh, and I even got into some discussion about, with Emmett about maybe changing the bass to forest because I had some particular ideas that I wanted to try to adapt um, from like what I had learned on acoustic guitar and and some of the melodic bass players I was really influenced by. Um, but then all of a sudden there was an announcement about the NS stick, and uh, as soon as that came out, and I and, and I heard that they were going to make this, you know, straight force eight-string instrument, I was like, wow, I got to get that. So like, 
I got on the waiting list right away, and I think it was another couple of years before it finally came out. I got the very first uh, one, an instrument from the very first production run, um, and that's what I played for the next I don't know four years, uh, maybe from 2000 no 98 99 till 2003 or four. Um, but I wasn't doing any solo stuff with it. I was just I was interested in doing bass lines with my left hand and then kind of like chords with my right. Nothing particularly um, uh, complicated. And um, for quite a long time, I was never really saw myself as a solo musician, both because um, I was kind of not really. I was kind of petrified of getting on stage by myself, and also I was just really interested in multi-track arrangement. So it just didn't, and I didn't really listen to a lot of solo music myself. So, um, but then I don't know what specifically happened. Oh, I know what it was. I got my first acoustic guitar in 2003, and suddenly it changed my whole perspective about solo instruments. It, I felt it was kind of neat after all these years of playing electronic instruments and being plugged into everything of just this freedom of ha having one instrument that just had one kind of sound that I could just take anywhere and play and it was it felt self-contained and complete in a certain way in a way that I hadn't experienced on other instruments before and so for a while I was thinking oh I want to just focus on acoustic guitar and then I thought well maybe I can do this whole thing on the stick if I kind of go back to what I was thinking about you know having fourth tuning on each side um, so I was kind of split between what, what, what do I want to do, um, and eventually I went to the 2004 Charlottesville seminar, and um, but, you know that was uh, learned a lot of stuff there, and so then I got a new instrument that year. In 2004, I ordered a Grand Stick with um, mirrored fourths tuning, and I haven't changed it since. Um, uh, when I was when I Traded my NS stick. Um, I traded it for a grand stick, with, um, and I tried parallel force at first, um, and uh, tried that for maybe a couple months, and then that was right around the time I moved to Virginia. And of course, I met up with Greg Howard. Told Greg Howard what I was thinking of doing, and um, almost thinking to myself, he's going to try to talk me back into fists. He did not, but he recommended that I mirror the tuning. That it would, my hands would find it more comfortable, and so, um, and he was right. Uh, when I reversed the strings, it actually wasn't much of a um, mental change to kind of think the other way in terms of like if I all these melodic bass lines that I had learned on a regular bass, it wasn't that difficult to make the adjustment of just going the other way, um, and. The chords, a lot of chords fall under the hands a lot easier. Your hands aren't, don't tend to be scrunched up as much. Um, so, so yeah, so basically the, the tuning, the instrument that I ordered in 2004, the Padu Grand, um, with mirrored force tuning is this exact same one I've been using uh, since then. So it's been, it'll be 10 years, actually, this year. Wow. So, so that's the long story of how I discovered the stick and what the different iterations of instruments that I was playing along the way. I, I find it really intriguing that uh, you you came up with the, the the tuning kind of thinking about it. You mentioned even like earlier on, like, mm -hmm. uh, um, and so is this. So the mirrored fourths tuning. Is there any way you can just kind of encapsulate like what the difference compared to like the fifths tuning that we're we're used to on standard stick tuning and the fourths. What what does that allow you to do that make that fifths won't? Sure. Um, well, I start. Well, first of all, the the challenge was to get the chords in a range that sound pretty good because um, I mean one of the big advantages of fifths is that you get these really nice wide chords. Um, with fourths, I had some very specific things that I wanted to adapt to the instrument. I was hugely influenced by. Well, first of all, my I'm a big progressive rock fan. I, I'm into the sort of English, the more pastoral side of English progressive rock. Like uh, my number one favorite band is Jethro Tull, you know, and then I'd be followed by you know Genesis, Gentle Giant. So, um, uh, very melodic, uh, 
harmonically interesting um, music, and Ian Anderson is a was a huge influence on me, uh, particularly around that time when I was thinking if I in that I wanted to maybe play acoustic guitar and focus on that. Um, he has some really uh, interesting techniques where he's not just strumming chords, but he's doing a lot of um, transitional fills between chords and playing a little melodic ideas in between chords, and he's doing a lot with um, you know, seconds in the chords, and, and so that particular sound, I wanted to try to adapt that to the stick. And of course, to do that, to be able to second in a chord, you have to, you know, it, it has to kind of be in fourth. You can't, I don't think you can physically play a, with just one hand, play a, a major second in fifths. Um, unless it's like really high up the neck or whatever. But um, so there's a particular sound I was going for, and the force allowed me to do that. And mirroring it made it much easier. Um, so I, I could, um, you know, I can hold a bass note and then be doing some pull-offs with my top fingers on the top strings, and I could, and I was able to, you know, arrange some of these these Jethro Tull acoustic songs that I that I really. Uh, loved uh, for many years, and so I just found it a very uh, satisfying experience. Um, you know, I give up some range compared to fifths, and I think my tuning really works the best on a grand stick. I don't think it works so well on a ten string, um, because you, I really depend on those high bass strings to fill out the top end of the chord, and then my bass goes down to low E, which is you know the same as a as a four string bass. So I give up a few low notes, and I give up some some high range, but um, but it, it allowed me to get the sound that I had in my head. Yeah, cool. And and so am I. Am I correct to say that? And Stick Enterprises actually offers that as a a tuning when you order an in instrument from them now. Yes. Uh, yep. Mirrored Forest is up there, and there's an article. I mean, that, yeah, that was really cool. Um, yeah. And, and and Emmett's been incur and you know, has been very encouraging in in the music I've been doing and in, in the tuning itself. And uh, so yeah, that was really cool. Um, I don't, you know, I don't know how many people are actually using it. I mean, I might know offhand of maybe four or five, but um, uh, yeah, it's it's really cool, and um, it it just really clicked for me. I mean, I know probably from a purely ergonomic standpoint, maybe fifths is is uh, better in that regard. There's you know, there's a couple chords that I do that kind of are, are a little bit of an awkward scrunch kind of thing, but. Um, you know, it just, but it, it just that closed voice kind of uh, acoustic guitar sound was what I was after, and it really helped me achieve that. Very cool. So, so you you mentioned about uh, your prog rock influences, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, so so you were also uh, you were featured in a, a documentary. Uh, about yes, um, Romantic Warriors is that it? That's right. Um, yeah, and uh, the story behind that is um, I heard about this documentary in progress, and I heard that they, you know, were featuring several modern progressive rock bands. And my probably my favorite current progressive rock band is um, it's a guy and a band called Fido, um, spelled P H I D E A U X. But he, he goes, you pronounce it Fido, as in the dog. Um, I just was really drawn to his music and. Um, you know, and I, and I, yeah, I've over the years have actually developed. I've seen him several times, developed a friendship with him, and um, I had a little flute part on one of his albums I, when I was out in L.A. Um, so just somebody, just somebody who made a big impact on me musically, and I heard that he was going to be one of the bands in this documentary. So I decided to, you know, they were doing some kind of a, a fundraising campaign. So I, so I uh, donated a few dollars, and then. When I did that, they contacted me. Um, they're based in uh, Maryland, I believe, which is not too far from where I live. They're on the north side of the DC Beltway, I'm south of it in Fredericksburg, Virginia. Um, and they, I don't know if they were completely aware of me or just looked me up when I, you know, made the donation, but they saw that I had a couple interesting um, connections to progressive rock that they found interesting. One was that I played in Chapman Stick. Um, and also, I worked in the music technology industry, and so my little segment kind of focuses. You know, I do play a tune, uh, but they were also interested in how music technology has has 
the impact of music technology on today's progressive rock scene and how it's made, you know, it's made it more accessible in, in terms of um, people creating the music. You know, people can, you know, record, you know, albums in their own house now. And um, so how technology has made it easier, not just for creating music, but also for getting, uh, you know, more obscure kinds of music out there, you know, so that people can hear it. Um, so yeah, so that was really neat uh, being in that documentary. Um, and, uh, so yeah, that's the story behind there, that document, that film. Okay. And so, so you, and so also, yeah, obviously, music technology is a big part of your life. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so from what I understand, it's what you do. Um, you programming like plugins and that kind of thing, or is, mm -hmm. that, is that right? That's exactly it. Um, I, uh, you know, my undergraduate degree is in computer science, and then after I graduated in '94, I was, you know, just worked uh, in the, you know, computer network industry, developing uh, firmware for for networking devices. Um, but as each year went by, it was like kind of the bug to go study music more fully. Like I, there wasn't, you couldn't minor in music where I went to college, um, but I took a lot of music electives, and obviously I did a lot on my own. Um, and I almost got, straight out of college, I was the first on the waiting list to go to Dartmouth's electroacoustic music program. And I was like so crushed by that. Uh, is, you know, I worked, I worked really hard on the application um, and uh, was so close. And they told me, you know, basically if any of the three people we've accepted decline, you know, you're in. And I just waited and waited and, you know, all three of them did accept. So. Um, so I was disappointed about that and went to work in the music industry and then four years later I applied to Dartmouth again and then this time I applied to Northwestern, um, their music technology program. And I once again got a rejection from Dartmouth and got into Northwestern. So, so that was a big adventure for me moving from, I've been in New, New England my whole life, uh, moved out to Chicago. Um, and those are probably the two most fun years of my life, to be honest. Uh, just, you know, basically being able to focus on software development and also just take, you know, standard conservatory classes in music theory and composition. Um, I took a jazz piano class because it was available and I could. I, you know, it was just so much fun. And uh, I learned a lot. And it helped get my foot in the door as far as getting, you know, working in this industry. I left, so after I got my master's degree there, I worked in the video game industry for two years. Midway uh, Games is, was right there in Chicago, so I uh, worked on the, on the sound engine development team, so I was basically responsible for the engine that, you know, streamed audio off the media and sound effects and panning and all that kind of, man, man, uh, managing sound assets for games. Um, did that for a couple of years. Um, but I think ultimately I was most interested in plug-in development. So uh, my wife and I moved back to Massachusetts in 2003, and uh, good timing. Um, a, a small company in, near Boston called WaveArts. Um, there was somebody leaving there who went on to become a product manager at Cakewalk and then Isotope. Um, I replaced him, and I've been at WaveArts since you know 2003 uh, doing plug-in development and also I do some part-time work for Camel Audio uh, based in Edinburgh uh, so I do some of the development for you know there's their alchemy software synthesizer and so that's that's a big thing that's going on right now is, is we're working on the next version of uh, alchemy um, and same with WaveArts, a lot of stuff going on not just with plugins but WaveArts also we do some licensing, consulting work in the telecommunications industry. So we're doing some voice over IP, um, video, or audio conferencing uh, technology. So, yeah. So it's insanely busy right now, um, to the point where it's it's you know I've, the gigs have, are almost non-existent the past couple months, uh, as well as practice time. But um, but yeah, I can't complain too much. I mean, it's it's cool. It's 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 inter interesting work and. Uh, I enjoy doing it, and I can do it from home. So even though the hours are really long, you know, there's been some 12, 14 hour days uh, quite a bit recently. Um, you know, it's nice to work at home and work on stuff that's, you know, fairly interesting. Yeah, very cool. So, so another thing I, I found really interesting was so, so 
Uh, tell us how you got hooked up uh, doing the TED Talk. Uh, I, th I believe that was in Orlando. Uh, yes. Um, well, the, the short story is uh, Dave Casey, who organized it, is a stick player, and he happens to like my music. So nice. <laughs> that's the, I didn't have to apply. I didn't have to do anything. He just he approached me because he came. You know, he I did a couple um, small stick workshops in Fredericksburg in 2000. Eight and nine, I think, uh, and he came to, and uh, you know, and then he and his wife were had decided to start up a local TED organization um, in Orlando, Florida, and uh, on their first one, he just you know he said he asked me if I wanted to play at it, and I said absolutely, and that was that was really cool, um, really neat experience. The people there were so receptive, and even though it's probably my, the biggest crowd I've ever. ever played in front of. Um, I wasn't as nervous as I was at some other gigs just because, I don't know, there's something in the atmosphere where people were just so welcoming and um, yeah, it was a really, really cool experience and um, yeah, there's a video of it. I think there's a YouTube video of, of yeah. one half of the performance up there. Um, yeah. Yeah, so it's, a, you know, it just happened, you know, I, I knew Dave and he's, you know, and he was organizing the conference so he asked me to do that, so. You, you seem to know a lot of the right people. <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're getting out there quite a bit. And, I mean, that's a, like, that's a huge thing. I mean, you're really like an ambassador for the, for the stick um, in that kind of role. Your music, you've also been featured on, like, Echoes and uh, I think some mm -hmm. other programs as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I, I recorded an album in 2010, uh, which is the culmination of, the five or six years that I had been uh, learning the stick and writing music, um, I just basically put it all down and recorded it, um, released it, and then did a bit. That was the most uh, active year that I actually tried to promote my music. Um, so I, I did actually send a CD to them and was surprised actually when when uh, John uh, contacted me and asked if I wanted to be on the show and I happened to be already heading up to the Philadelphia area um, for a house concert and also to play uh, at the New Jersey Prague House, um, which is a show, uh, which is like a series that uh, of progressive rock concerts that um, one of the guys, I think he, he was associated with Nearfest, um, you know, oh, Alan Benjamin actually, from, he was a stick player from the band Advent. He's the one who actually asked me if I wanted to come up. So I did that show with Steve Hahn. Uh, some of you may be familiar oh, with Steve. Oh, yeah, I know Steve. He's so, yeah, so Steve and I played a show up there, and he he and I also uh, did a show down here in Fredericksburg with Greg Howard um, a couple uh, a few years ago. So that was that was really cool. Um, so, yeah, that's... So, so yeah, that was, that, that was my little mini tour after I released the album as I did three shows, like uh, Philadelphia, the Echo Show, and then up in New Jersey, I did a show. Um, so, yeah. It was a really fun experience. Nice. So, so as a you know, an outside observer, it seems to me that like the the really big turning point for you was that the one cloud video. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't know how many views that has now. It's way up there. Um, and so, can you talk a little bit about that? Like, where uh, where were you in your kind of playing and process? writing process and stuff when you posted that video and and mm -hmm. what you know did you have any inkling anything would happen with that no absolutely not I was in experimentation mode um, it was when I was first starting to write music on the instrument uh, and one cloud was the very first thing I wrote and I had had my instrument um, it was within a year of getting the instrument that I was developing that tune mm -hmm. and at the time I got uh, a new MacBook for work, and it had a built-in camera, so it was just sort of an experiment. You know, I'll try recording myself and putting it up on YouTube, and I don't know what take that was. It might have been, you know, 17th or 18th take. Uh, you know, I wasn't familiar with video editing or how to do all that. I just basically started it and went as far as I could until I really screwed up, and then I would start over. <laughs> uh -huh. Very frustrating experience. Um, and I yeah. still find recording to be a frustrating experience. It still doesn't come very natural in, to me. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll kind of admit that um, the more recent videos you see 
uh, do benefit from some editing. Um, I and I don't think I've ever played a song perfectly, and all the times I practice or played in front of people, I don't think I've ever played anything perfectly. So, um, yes, I will freely admit that uh, videos you see of me within the last few years uh, are are never one take all the way through. Um, and that's just the way it is. I, you know, I'll, I'll use the technology to my advantage, and um, uh, you know, and that could be partly because I, I think I conceptualize uh, the things I want to be able to do on the instrument is always like slightly ahead of where I'm at physically, you know, skill-wise. Um, so I'm always sort of trying to push myself forward, and the things I want to do, you know, I still feel like I'm learning how to play the songs on one cloud. To be honest with you. And uh, if I re-recorded the album now, I think it would sound significantly better, uh, just because it's a snapshot of where I was in 2010. And, exactly. Um, yeah. You know, it's uh, so it's it's it, I don't know what to do. I'm almost actually sold out of the CD. I mean, and 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 so it makes me wonder, like, do it, would I actually want to re-record the album in a few years or reprint another thousand of that? You know, when it doesn't really represent me as accurately anymore. I don't know. It's an interesting. Thing to think about, but um, anyway, getting back to the YouTube, YouTube video. So I put it up, and um, and I think part of it is, uh, you know, a lot of people like the song. Also, I think I caught the wave at just the right time when when uh, it was like around 2005, 2006, when you know somebody making music in in their bedroom or home or whatever could get more recognition. I think I think uh, YouTube. More recently, has become kind of dominated by music labels again, like, um, and it's much harder. So when I put up new videos now, even though the production is much better and the sound is much better, um, you know, I'm lucky to get over the course of a year, you know, a couple of thousand one, you know, it's several hundreds of thousands of hits uh, at this point, and. Um, you know, and so I got caught on the wave at just the right time, so that when people search for "stick now," you know, that one cloud pops up near the top there, and so it's kind of a self-perpetuating thing where people, you know, search for it, they see it, and they watch it, and um, so yeah. But it is surprising because I had absolutely no intention of of making some kind of like landmark contribution to the stick world. That's not how I saw it at all, um, but. You know, it's it's neat. It's certainly a cool thing, um, and I'm not, you know, I'm not going to complain about the number of hits it has. So, um, so, so did you did you feel pressured after that to to get the CD together? Um, a bit, yeah. Um, because yeah, people would ask, and uh, and and I felt like yeah, I wanted to sort of all this music that I had been developing. I thought it would be nice to to kind of um, permanently record that and release it. Um, you know, it was, it was, like I said, it's before, always feeling like I'm, my fingers are a little bit behind what my brain wants to do. Uh, it was it was a very frustrating process recording the album, uh, getting the takes that I was happy with and getting all the editing right. Um, it's like the opposite of Greg's his Dick Figures album, the one where he had to, everything is recorded like one yeah. take. Um, you know, and he just—that's how he learned the instrument. He just played it over and over and over and over again till he got the right, you know, he got the right take. And so, one cloud is the opposite of that. <laughs> one cloud is, um, uh, you know, I—I th I think I like a lot of the compositional ideas on the album, um, and I, in a, in a way, they're still evolving. The pieces are still evolving. When I play them live now, I, you know, I think of little variations or differences that that. Um, that I like even more. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it feels like a, the, the music on the album is still evolving in a way. Well, well, I have to tell you the story. Of, you know, I, I play a lot of gigs out, and every so often I get people who come up to me who say, you know, we've seen this. We've seen this video of this this guy playing on YouTube, mm -hmm. and and they're always referring to you, <laughs> and uh, I I always find that. That interesting, and I also have a friend here in Colorado who um, he he cites you as being uh, the motivating factor. He now owns three sticks, um, but he heard one cloud, and that was like a turning point for him. And he he had to go, he had to have a stick after seeing that. So yeah. 
Cool. It's, that's uh, yeah. really influenced a lot of people. That's really neat, and um, and I would I would have to say um, that that kind of you had asked before if I felt pressured to do an album. I would mm -hmm. say actually more than that, it was the encouragement I got from people that just totally exceeded my expectations. Like if I just put up a couple videos and you know just got a few dozen hits and nobody made anything of it. Um, I really don't know that I would have the motivation, would have had the motivation to go through and try to record an album, or maybe I just would have waited several more years, or whatever. So uh, that kind of positive feedback was incredibly, incredibly encouraging, um, and that was probably you know the big motivating factor in me finally you know sitting down and writing the album. Yeah, very cool. So so and so. So, so last week you you did a uh, a special edition about about kind of your effects, and um, but so when you when you're playing out like normal gigs, I'm I'm just kind of curious about. Um, so you do covers as well, um, and and I imagine you're doing a mix of originals, covers, and. Um, and it seems to me that your use of a, the effects is pretty integrated in, into that whole mix. Um, so, so just really briefly, uh, you know, what what is your setup if you're if you're playing out? Uh, right at the current uh, time, um, I the center of my rig is the Pod HD 500, as I talked about last week. Uh, I use an external reverb. I use a Strymon uh, Big Sky, which I got recently. Um, I was using a um, their smaller reverb pedal. Um, uh, the name eludes me. It was something else, Sky. Blue Sky. Blue Sky. And then I upgraded to Big Sky because it does a lot more stuff. Um, and I'm using QSC speakers, uh, a KW122 for when I need a lot of sound, and a K10 when I just need to go to a venue that has a PA, and I just need something for a monitor, something I can put in front of me, pointing up at me. The K10 is is super flexible like that. You can, put, if you wanted to put it on a on a PA stand, you could, but you can also just sit it on the ground like a wedge and point it up at you. Um, and I've got a step about that I have before the the HD500, both for its EQ capabilities and because of its uh, switching capabilities. Um, uh, one of the things I did with the stick when I first got it um, uh, was to use parallel signal uh, chains on each side. So I like to have like a clean, like on the melody side, I would typically have a clean sort of sound. And then on top of that, I would have like an, a Boss SE70 with like a slow gear effect and some delay in chorus. So it was almost like had this subtle synth tone in the background. Right. Um, and so that was a big part of my sound uh, starting off. Uh, I was going for this huge, lush, you know, delay, chorus, drenched thing. Um, and so that's how I did it. I would, I would, I would stack uh, effects chains in parallel. And uh, so I can kind of do that again. I mean, with the Pod HD 500, I'm kind of giving up that flexibility rather than having, like, discrete uh, effects processors for each side. Um, I can kind of get that back again by, you know, I can basically send the bass side to both, you know, the A and B paths and have, like, that, you know, more synth kind of sound on one channel and the clean sound on the other. Uh, so it's nice to be able to do that sort of layering again. So... So that was the big reason why I added the step back into my system. But um, yeah, it has changed a lot over the years. For a while, I was just running straight into a Fishman solo amp and just using no effects at all except for the reverb, and um, that kind of helped develop my me develop my technique a lot. Um, I couldn't really hide behind uh, anything, and uh, and that's what I would bring to open mics for for 2008. You know, I really set out to I'm gonna you know. I want to do the solo music thing. I'm going to get over my fear of playing in front of people. I'll just go out and uh, play every week, and that's what I did. And most of the time, I just brought my solo amp with me and just set up. And you know, it was like a two-minute setup. Just put your solo amp on stage, plug in, and go. Um, and so I was very minimal for a little while, and and, and now uh, the technology is creeping back in, for better or worse. It's, it's a balance. Um, I, I even have, uh, yeah. Yeah, because um, technology is a funny thing. Uh, you know, it's part of what I do for a career. 
Uh, on the other hand, I find that before I was focusing on the stick as a solo instrument, um, you know, I feel like I was accumulating all this gear, you know, rack mount synthesizers and new software, and I felt like the more tools and the more things I had, the less productive I was. Uh, you know, I made more music when I just had one little Yamaha SY22 synthesizer than when I had all this other gear. You know, I was single. I could, I had some extra income I could blow on, on gear, but I made less and less music. And what I sort of discovered with the stick is that uh, the more constraints I have, or if I have like a predefined area where I know I have to work within, um, I'm more productive and I'm able to come up with more stuff and actually get something done. Um, so, yeah. So, the, so it's, yeah, the temptation is like, oh, wow, that looks like a really cool piece of gear and I want to add that in. But mm. there's a, a big risk, at least with me, that it's just going to be another thing I have to learn to program and tweak and, I don't know, but as the no, years I goes on, I just I, I enjoy tweaking sound modules less and less over the years. I just want to yeah. be able to play. I, I'm quite pleased to hear you say that. I mean, I, I feel like I wasted the entire decade of the 90s just scrolling through uh, patches yep. and making sounds and no music at all. So, um, and I have a similar approach where you know I, I tend to stay away from the technology because I, I feel like I have a problem. I can't. Um, I can't limit myself. I, I find it really hard to uh, incorporate it without going overboard. So yeah. Uh, so yeah, I'm glad to hear that you're able to balance that to to some degree and get work done. Which leads to the the next uh, point is uh, is kind of so I, I I know that right now you are quite busy with work stuff and you said that you're not really gigging much or even practicing. But uh, what's next? Are you are you planning on a new CD? Are you writing? Are you? Uh... Um, I would yeah. say my focus right in the past four months. Um, what I did do is upgrade my video recording capabilities. So the last three videos I've done, you might notice where I kind of I'm standing in deep space with a black background behind me. Um, I got a new camera. I've been learning to use Final Cut Pro. Um, you got. An, I don't know if you can see it behind me, but there's actually a umbrella light. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So I got yeah. some like better lighting, and I got a black backdrop, which I have against one wall. Um, you know, so I actually I wanted to improve my video presentation. I thought that that was because because I have you know a lot of followers on YouTube. That's, that's sort of like the most effective use of my time is to, and I've got a lot of cover material in particular that I may not be inclined to just release an album of because of having to deal with all the, um, I don't, the licensing and everything like that. That I could just do videos of my cover tunes, um, many of which, if you haven't seen me play live, you've, you haven't heard yet. I have, you know, there's several more things I could record, um, but mo a lot of people haven't heard yet. So, so what I'd like to do. Um, in the next year or so is to do more videos, um, you know, continue to improve the sound and video quality of those. Because um, I've got a lot of material. I've probably got more cover material than I do original stuff at this point. Um, so that's one thing I'd like to do. I'm, I'm very tempted to, getting back to technology, incorporate um, subtle use of um, electronics and synthesizers just because the thing I'm working on now, Alchemy, is so cool, and, and it's already giving me some ideas of things I could do. But like foot, basically foot control uh, synthesizers. So whether it's, um, you know, not to the point of maybe pre-canned loops or whatever, but just um, subtle, subtle stuff um, that I could control with a with a MIDI foot controller um, using some of the software that I've developed. Um, um, but yeah, it's it's a but it's tricky. It's it could easily get out of hand, and I could end up not doing anything, not developing any significant music, just because it gets to be. I'm spending too much of of my limited time, you know, trying to tweak synthesizer patches, and that's what I <laughs> want to avoid. Um, yeah, but it would be new. But it would be neat because I've just I've always loved uh, sound synthesis, especially when it's mixed with, um, you know you know, natural string vibrations uh, from, you know, playing a string acoustic instrument or something like that. So um, I, I've always enjoyed, the you know, the blend of those two kinds of um, 
uh, timbres, I guess you could say. Uh, so it'd be interesting to see if I could uh, incorporate electronics a little bit more, but not too over the top, I guess. Cool. So, so I think it is probably a good time to open this up for some questions. So, uh, I, uh, Russell's saying that I've all, I'm taking all his questions, but <laughs> you know, yeah, you are. <laughs> hey, Rob, how are you? Uh, good. How's it going, Kevin? Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Uh, I don't know if I have any questions. I just want to make a few observations. Uh, we really love you around this house. Uh, your record gets played. Uh, uh, if you could wear out a digital album, you, uh, I, I would have worn out your record a long time. But, uh, we really like you. Uh, we're looking forward to a new record, and uh, it's good to meet you, man. I really appreciate the help with the HD 500 a few months ago, too, or last year, whenever it was. I can't quite remember, but uh, thanks, man. Dig it. Sure. Thanks, Kevin. Appreciate it. All right. Anyone else? Yeah, Rob, I was, I was just going to say, on, on a very superficial level, there's something so cool looking about your stick. <laughs> on all the videos, it's a Padoue, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I have a Padoue. Mine doesn't look like that. What the heck? <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, but uh, I was just uh, going to ask in general, when you do practice, uh, you know, what kind of things do you focus on? Um, I, I focus exclusively on developing songs. I don't practice rudiments. I don't do exercises, um, for better or worse. Um, I don't consider myself a particularly um, polished or technical player by any means, especially considering I play a lot of gigs with Greg Howard. and um, It's very hard to feel like you're technically uh, accomplished when you do gigs with Greg Howard. Or you do stick nights you know, and you're playing with guys like Steve Adelson and whatever. Um, as much of an honor as it is to do those kind of things, um, <laughs> I I, um, I I tend to wallow in self doubt a lot, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it's very easy to just uh, say, "Wow!" I, I honestly have, the thought has come into my mind when I played at a stick night that you know, I just feel like a total hack. Um, well, you look like you know what you're doing. <laughs> I, I I well, that's that's one of the key things I learned during open mics is as long as you don't let on that you just are you're in the midst of a train wreck. <laughs> then um, a lot of people won't notice, especially if. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, to, uh, I mean, man, there are so many times I've been on stage and just I'm in, it's just a, literally a wreck. I just I completely forget what the next chord is. I I and then I have to noodle my way back to a place where I'm comfortable again. And that's 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 the thing that's cool about like low key gigs is just learning how to do that. You can't really practice that at home. Because you know, it's it's just when you get up on stage that you have the, the weird mind blank that just has never happened to you before, and something right. you played thousands of times you just can't. I, I just don't know how to play this anymore. Um, you know, so dealing with panic and, and recovering and whatever. Anyway, so yes, so so I feel um, I, I feel like you know it's the sort of theme that I was getting at earlier that I feel like my brain is is ahead of my fingers uh, most of the time so uh, so it's, it's getting better um, I you know I think I can play uh, my compositions uh, a lot better now than I could when I recorded the album um, anyway I'm it's, pr it's probably a good, place, what was the word? a good place to be in because you know I mean fingers with no brain <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, I wanted to add on to that. Um, so I had the privilege of seeing Rob play at the uh, Stick Night Out in Anaheim back in January, and that was that was a really unique opportunity because you know there are all these cats out coming out from Nam, and uh, of which Rob was one, and you know. I remember I was trying to put something together, like, you know, wouldn't it be cool? And it always starts kind of with Emmett, like, hey, are you around? Are you into it? And he said, yeah. And as soon as we got that, we got Steve, and we're trying to get other people. And, and uh, it's like the opportunity not to have Rob included was just too amazing. And it's kind of funny because Rob's like, oh, yeah, I, I knew I hit the big time when I was playing with Steve. And I was like, dude, you've got like five million hits on your sites or something. You hit the big time, like, 
five years ago, didn't you? Like, <laughs> so I just had to kind of laugh. I was just I was like, huh, I guess. And then, um, and that was kind of cool because that was the first time I got to see you play live. But um, I remember asking you about it. You know, we were trying to get all the requirements for everyone. Like, what amps do you need? What are you going to do? Tom G was going to be there, so he's got his bitchin' rig, and I always kind of like ride his coattails because he's got a fantastic rig and you can just plug into it and he's pretty cool about letting all the stick players use it. And um, <laughs> another funny story on that. Um, Rob's like, yeah, I'll just plug in the HD 500. It's cool. PA, amp, whatever. I'll just plug into something. And and uh, and I really was impressed. You know, um, I think uh, Emmett came up and introduced you. And um, yeah. it was so fantastic because... When I closed my eyes, it felt like I was listening to the album, and I didn't have or sense any of that self-doubt or whatever it was that you worked out in the coffee shop so long ago, and it was fantastic. And of all the people that played that evening, um, it was so tight and spot on, and it was played like a technician, and I really enjoyed it. And I remember I had my HD 500. That was one of the first shows I had my 500X for. And I was like, I saw you play. I was like, I'm not playing mine. <laughs> and then the funny part okay so here's the funny part sorry to totally barnstorm um, I had a, an echo pedal I had this little echo pedal that I was using that was a big part of my sound on my melody side and uh, so I scrapped the, the ideas for the HD 500 just kind of set it aside for later <laughs> for later right um, who wants to go on after Rob Martino? Anyone? Not me. Certainly not me. You know, and I think it was like the second set, right? So, anyways, uh, <laughs> I had I had my little echo pedal plugged in, but I had plugged it in kind of close to the back of the amp, and Tom G came after me, and so Tom plugged in, and he's getting his sound, and he's like five minutes into a song, and he's like, "What is all that echo?" And he. <laughs> <laughs> Sure enough, my little pedal was still plugged in there, and Tom comes back. <laughs> Dude, what are you doing? And he's got like seven racks, and there's two different amps, and it's bi-amped, and he's got his MIDI trip, and then there's my little like poo box, echo box that he's just like <laughs> out of here. <laughs> anyway, so I suppose what I was getting at was is uh is 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 making recoveries like Rob you, you talked about that and I think that's a real that's a real thing is finding ways to recover and there are things that you can't work out at home right and so like how do you how do you work around that other than just like this trial by fire where you get out there and you fall down you know and, and uh, um, I remember Greg Howard saying Practice at different parts of the song. Start at different parts of the song so that you're comfortable at any given moment starting from a certain place. And he said that he'd be in restaurants and people would be trying to talk to him. Like, what is that? What is that? Right? And they're like paying their bill and walking out. And he would kind of lose his place. And so he would have to start from different parts in the song. And so when you're playing your original material and like you now... Are there parts that you're improvising, or are there parts that you have to come back to, or like, how do you do? You have any tips for like getting back to like a base where you can like get the song yeah. back on track? There are um, at at this point in my performances, there's um, there's a combination of some improvisation mixed with mostly highly composed things where every note is in a precise place. And um, I guess what I've tended to do is, like, I know the overall structure of a song, and I'll generally remember um, my key parts of the song where, where my handshake, like, I'll remember the chord and the melody note for that when that section starts. And if I get lost before that section, I may suddenly turn that highly composed section into an improv section. And um, you know, I'll know roughly the chords in that part of the piece, and maybe I'll just alternate between two chords and just kind of noodle over that chord progression while I kind of compose myself internally. Um, and then I'll, I'll kind of slowly think about, now how can I transition to where I know I have to be next? 
Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so I, it's it's I'm, I'm trying to think of something more tangible than that. Um, but but I guess what basically when a train wreck happens and I just completely lose my place, it just suddenly becomes uh, an improvisational section and um, doing maybe a very a similar more simplified um, chord progression to where to where I was. Um, Maybe just play one chord or play two chords and go back and forth, and then just kind of, you know, my my hands are comfortable enough that I know, you know, what I can do with with my right hand, my melody hand aside to, you know, improvise over, that, noodle over that a little bit, uh, and then, and it's something that's that's uh, automatic enough that I can dedicate part of my brain to thinking about, okay, how do I want to transition into the next thing? Uh, one thing that happened to me at the New Jersey. Prague House show with Steve Hahn was um, uh, the third Enigma. I said, I don't know why I do this to myself, but it was like 50 or 60 diehard progressive rock fans there. I decided to play my most complicated uh, piece from the album, and uh, and as, as I was playing it, I realized I was just playing. The second thing I realized, I'm in a section near the end of the song, and I realized I skipped like two or three sections before it. So on the fly, I just basically had to arrange it. I mean, I just have this idea in my head where I know where these, I kind of make, it's like an abstraction. It's like I know that there's this big section, there's this big section, there's this big section. And if I get lost, I just try to back up and look at the whole overall picture and say, okay, I know it, I know this piece has these four or five sections. I think where I'm at now, maybe I can go back into this section. So basically, I reordered the entire piece on the fly in front of 60 people and just trying not to let on that I'm absolutely panicking. <laughs> See now, if you were with a bunch of stickists, then I'll be like, oh, he recomposed it live. They, they all know They all, they all know the songs, right? Especially Kevin. Kevin would be like, yeah, he's changed that up. Yeah, that happened, that happened when I opened for that, that guy I mentioned before, uh, the band uh, Fido. I actually did open for his band in, in Baltimore. And uh, I totally just screwed up the long circle. I just, um, it was one of those things where I actually over-practiced to the point where I was concentrating so much on what I had to do rather than just trusting my, my kind of, my motor reflexes. If, um, that I just completely flubbed up the solos in every song. And I, I just got to a point where I just did not know what to do next, so I just like made up this chord progression and just improvised over it. And, and Fido said to me afterwards, "He's like, oh, there's, yeah, I didn't recognize that new section in one class." <laughs> <one class." laughs> I just threw that up so bad that I just had to make something up on the fly. Um, yeah, that's oh, yeah. jazz, man. Yeah, creative music. And that's actually that actually is one technique that I found where I feel like if I'm getting into a point where I'm starting to panic a little bit, actually, I think about it less than try to concentrate harder. If I let my muscle memory take over, that has saved me a lot of times. Mm-hmm. Rather than like think about like what exact note am I playing on my right hand or what if I concentrate too hard and I look at my fretboard and I think about what I have to do next, that's when it gets worse than if I just mm-hmm mentally step back and let my muscle memory take over. So that's one useful thing that I've discovered when, when I get into one of these situations. Relax. <laughs> so Rob, then you, you were mostly completely self-taught based on your prior musical knowledge. On the stick, I mean. Yes. Uh, I did, um, when I moved to Virginia, uh, I did take some lessons with Greg Howard, and he's been a, a very encouraging and, and um, a really great resource. So, and he, you know, he's taught at the at the two um, uh, Fred Tapp seminars I did in Fredericksburg, and I've also gone to stuff that he's done in Charlottesville. So, so I've had a lot of, you know, I, I've learned a lot from from being around him, and um, you know, he's a good friend. And um, uh, so yeah, so he he's helped me a lot in terms of like not getting into bad habits. I mean. He would still say that I that I don't use enough hand hand uh, muscle movement in my in my right hand, but um, uh, I tend to still type a little bit with my right hand than using all the muscle memory that he encourages. But um, yeah, he's he's been a great resource. But other than as far as like the music that I developed, um, that's just you know that comes from the you know a lot of it's just pulled together from ideas 
that I, I learned on other instruments or particular songs that I learned on other instruments or particular influences. Um, so yeah, so like the main bass line in the long, middle of the long circle, which was originally called Noodle Soup in one of my old, old videos. That's actually something I came up with on acoustic guitar and I wanted to see if I could adapt it to the stick. There's other stuff that based on keyboard music that I wrote uh, a long time ago. So um, so that's helped to kind of like, it's in terms of like getting ideas and generating ideas and you know, doing something on a different instrument and then trying to adapt it to the stick has been kind of, um, a lot of songs have sort of developed that way. Do you ever feel uh, the desire to go and try the NS stick again? Um, did you get not that? really. Um, no. I think I found that... Um, if I wanted to play a bass part or a guitar part, that those instruments, you know, play a bass or play a guitar. Um, I mean, the NS stick was, I mean, it was cool in the sense that it was, uh, you know, it's like the Swiss Army knife of, of musical instruments where you could play it traditionally as a bass or a guitar. Um, but for the solo music I wanted to do, um, I almost immediately found, like, I think I was trying to play, like, a Bach Goldberg variation on the NS stick, and it was just kind of this aha moment that, like, wow, if I had the two... Um, zones on a grand stick, this would be so much easier. Um, and so it, it kind of made me realize, you know, if I went back to a grand stick, that some of these solo music ideas that I had in my mind, that I'd be able to, to uh, realize those better. But still, I mean, the Dennis, I had it for several years, it's, you know, certainly a, a really cool, well designed instrument. Oh, um, sure. So, but it just like, but I just felt like going back to the grand stick was, had the most uh, possibilities. Well, <laughs> okay. So I think, Gene, are we are we uh, about are time we here? Time. Yeah, it's about we've we've had a uh, about forty fifty minutes here, and generally that's you know what we shoot for. Um, I suppose uh, one other one other question that I might like to ask is is for for someone as much. You know, doing what you're doing, Rob. Like, what do you recommend for people that have just started the instrument? For people who are just who are fans of the music, who are maybe overwhelmed. You know, they're you know, like there's been a couple really good discussions on the stickist recently. But mm -hmm. like, what sort of suggestions do you have for someone that's maybe you know a year or even two years into the stick that's looking for inspiration that that you could offer? You know based mm -hmm. on what you've learned? Um, I think it's having specific songs or, or a specific goal. Uh, I think for a long time, uh, it's a stick didn't really uh, click with me because I just, it was more of a concept and there's all the stuff I could do, but I just didn't really know where to go with it. And then when I said, okay, I want to be able to play these specific songs, these specific Jeff Tall songs or, or whatever, um, I had a goal, and it, it, it just it created its own um, uh, set of things to work on. It created its own exercises. It's like, okay, how do I figure out it, how do I figure out these chords? How do I figure out how to play these chords? You know, start slow. It's like, how do I voice this chord? How do I move from this chord to the next? And then, how do I play the melody while I'm doing those chords? And you're just kind of building up from that. Is there something? I found that there has to be something very specific to work on rather than just like with a lot of instruments, like with bass and guitars, it's like I just noodled for a while and then I put the instrument down. And it's just like I didn't really have a, a goal or, or whatever I wanted, what I wanted to do with it. And I mean, like I said before, I don't, I don't set aside time to like practice rudiments and, and whatever. And I don't know that that's really the best thing to uh, recommend for a beginner. Um, but I enjoyed it the most where I just said, okay, I want to learn Wondering Aloud by Jethro Tull, and so I'm just going to spend a little time each day and figure out how did he, that little fill he did on the guitar, like, can I do that on the instrument? Um, so having that specific goal, and then like other people said, like, you'll, you'll improve leaps and bounds uh, just by, you know, having a lesson with somebody who's really experienced and can help you, you know, specifically with um, getting you on the right foot with posture and and not developing bad habits because if you know it can get very frustrating um, if you're not 
you know, if you're not wearing the instrument, you know, the way it was designed to be worn or whatever. So having somebody experienced to help you is also very helpful. So those are the only two things that really come to mind for me, I think. Um, yeah. It's good advice. It's good advice. Cool. Well, uh, David Tipton, sir, what uh, what are the questions? You, you, is there anything else that you want to cover here in the in the in our discussion here? <laughs> I'm not sure. I think we've covered a lot of ground, and uh, you know, I'm I'm a big fan of Rob's music too. That that CD gets played here a lot, um, and uh, you know, I'm I'm eager to hear more. I'm I'm always looking looking out for for his videos and uh, and actually uh, that's you know that's the thing I'm I'm at the point where I'm considering like nicer camera equipment and making better quality videos I'm I'm certainly not happy with with the quality of mine and uh, you know I, w I would like to do something like that and uh, and I also I, I appreciate like you you bringing up topics like uh, you know like being nervous about performing that's that was a huge thing for me and it still is um, and and things about you know like your your CD and now um, for me it's the same thing with mine I, I play these tunes out all the time now and I'm much more comfortable with them now and I've thought about re-recording that because uh, I listen to to it and it's it's like a postcard of where I was at, at that time and uh, so th those are great things to hear from another musician. You know, it, it uh, we're we're all kind of in the same boat, and uh, and you know, I I hope your uh, work lightens up to the point where you can get out and do some performing here. Yeah, me too. Yeah, more more recorded material, man. That's, <laughs> Absolutely. That's, that's what I would love to hear. Thanks, guys. I appreciate cool. it. I appreciate the invite and. Thanks for coming out, Rob. It's been awesome. Sure thing. Cool. Thanks, Rob. All right. So I I guess that's going to do it. Are there any announcements or anything like that, Gene, that we... Oh, uh, yeah, good call. Yeah, well, uh, thanks to you, David, and to Rob and Russell and Kev for making it out, for sure. Um, next week is uh, Kyle McCann. So he's uh, this kind of new kid, uh, an NS player, um, out in Utah. And uh, he plays with Jurassic Jam. They put some cool videos up recently. And so he's going to come out. And actually, Flint Blade is going to run the session. Oh, so cool. that'll be fun. Yeah, I talked to Flint today, and he's, he's in. So uh, I was just delighted that he could kind of come back on the, the, and, and host a session. So that'll be some younger cats, you know, talking about the stick and the NS and that sort of thing. And... Well, you know, Kyle's a great, um, he plays in a band, so that it adds kind of a cool element. You know, we talked to a lot of soloists and a lot of guys that are doing their own things, so that will add a lot of flavor to what we're doing. And then um, June, uh, I'm pretty excited to announce, is all Canadian stick players. <laughs> so um, I'm pretty sure that we've got Dale locked in for the 6th, and that will be with Dave Broski, so you can imagine that will just be super fun. <laughs> uh, these Just these wonderful stick personalities coming together, and then I'm pretty sure the 13th, Kevin, you're going to maybe show us some Elton John songs? Yeah, awesome. Get over your fears! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, our guest will be uh, Kevin Kaysom. And then uh, I think June 20th, we're trying to, to get Jim uh, Riley. So we want to talk about um, the book. He's working on a book about Emmett. And um, any suggestions for hosts, we're open to that. And then hopefully Jim Riley at the end of the month. Uh, Jim Meyer, excuse me. Um, and so we'll have the Jims represented and all of our uh, uh, friends up north and... Uh, so that's that's what we've got on tap for June, and um, it should be exciting. So right on. Is right it the on. is the Vancouver uh, stick seminar? Is that this weekend? That's right. Going on? That starts tomorrow. So uh, or it maybe started today, but um, I know that Dale was flying up there, and I saw pictures of her and, and, and Jim up on Facebook. So yeah, that'll be great. And Tom G is going to be up there. So what a fantastic event that's going to be. So I'm very excited about that, and hoping to see some pictures and see what they're what they're up to. Cool. 
Cool. Well, uh, David, thanks again. Rob, a real great, great. Thanks for taking time out. Kevin and Russell, always a pleasure, gentlemen. Thanks, guys. Uh, Happy good Free Hands Friday. See you again. Thanks, everyone. Friday. Nice talking to you, Rob. Thank you. Nice talking to you too.